I guess we can go ahead and get started. It's just a couple minutes. So, um, quick introduction. My name is Melody. I'm with Oyez Real Estate. It's pronounced Oyez, like oh yes, but Oyez. <laughs> um, maybe I should turn this on. Again, feel free to ask me any questions at any time during the presentation. Um, it's normally a two-hour class, so I squeeze it into one hour, so I may be kind of talking a little fast, so interrupt me, tell me to slow down, repeat myself, or ask me a question. <laughs> um, my brokerage, all we do is specialize in short sales. That's what we do. Um, I don't list pretty houses. I don't go show houses. I can, but I choose to do the short sales. We have successfully closed uh, hundreds of short sales since 2007. and. Uh, to make us what we are, we have a full team of negotiators, processors, we have an on-staff attorney, and we have agents to help with this process. It is a, a large process, so it's very helpful to have a, a good team to work with. Um, and then I pretty much have experience with every mortgage lender that you've heard of. I have probably dealt with them. So. Moving on, what is a short sale? A short sale is a property that is sold less than what the mortgage is worth. So a lender will accept the short payoff as a payment in full. So let's say you owe 85,000 on a mortgage, we get the bank to accept it at 60,000, that dif the difference is waived. They, the bank will not seek recourse to the homeowner, to the seller. Um, for, uh, excuse me, a short sale is a pre-foreclosure, so it is not a foreclosed. You know, when it's foreclosed, that means the bank owns it, in a short sale, the seller still owns it. Bring it down. So in order for a homeowner or a seller to qualify for a short sale, they must meet two criteria. One, the house has to be upside down in value. And two, they have to have a financial hardship. Financial hardship could mean a bunch of different things. They lost their job, uh, forced relocation, divorce. I see that one a lot where the, the home was purchased as a two income property and now they're divorced, they can't afford it on their, on their single income. So those are some of the reasons that a, a financial hardship would be. So why would a seller want to do a short sale? They know that they have missed payments, they're upside down, they can't catch up, maybe they've tried a loan modification but it's failed. A number one reason is to avoid a foreclosure. As we all know, foreclosures are the worst for homeowners. We had um, somebody call, call us, um, it was a homeowner, he's married, he let his wife make the payments. He worked for a security system, uh, installing alarm systems in a home. Um, the wife missed payments, you know, for whatever reason they got behind. Um, the property ended up foreclosing. So they moved on, you know, they, they bought a new house. Well, sorry, they didn't buy a new house, but they got to a new house. Now the husband was up for a promotion in his job. They did a background check, they did another clearance check for the promotion, they saw that he had a foreclosure on his record and they actually let him go. A foreclosure impacts people that I don't think they really truly realize, even 10 years down the road. I mean, if somebody has a foreclosure on their property, it could prevent them from getting a job in the future. So it's really important. So avoiding a foreclosure is, you know, number one. Um, they won't owe the lender any money, I talked about that just a second ago. There will be no recourse to the seller. The short lender will waive the deficiency. That is something that we strive for when agents as uh, representing the sellers, what we will, will definitely strive to get. Um, they could possibly receive incentive money if they're in the property. Um, they could receive up to $10,000 relocation money. So that is a definite benefit to the homeowners. Um, then they get extra time in their house. They're obviously struggling. Maybe they're behind on other bills. So this will allow them to stop making their mortgage payments, save money to be able to move and to afford another place. And lastly, there is no cost to the homeowner for doing this. The, the lenders will actually pay the commission. So that's kind of how we get paid. So why would a lender want to do a short sale? Um, instead of going to foreclosure and having all the added costs, you know, holding costs, maintenance costs, HOA costs, things like that, even hiring the attorney to do the foreclosure, that costs money. So basically we're doing the job for the lender. We're selling it for them so they don't have to spend the money. It's also a program that the lenders will offer the homeowners. They will say you've missed payments, you can try a loan modification. If that doesn't work, then it's going to be a short sale is their last option. So they even offer that to the homeowners. Okay, so benefit of uh, short sale, sorry, I went too far. Oh, nope, okay, sorry, didn't mean to make you dizzy. <laughs> 
Okay, so now you know what a short sale is. You know how to qualify the seller for a short sale. Now you get the phone call and you find out that the seller is upside down. So what you wanna do is this is a list of basically everything that you'll need to get as far as the short sale process goes. Um, you wanna get your listing agreement. Most lenders won't even start a short sale without a listing agreement or an MLS. So it is really helpful to have an agent who can provide those for you. As an agent, obviously you can do that yourselves. Um, you wanna do the title search. You wanna get letters of authorizations to be able to speak to the banks on behalf of your homeowner. You'll have to initiate it. You'll need to pick a price. You'll have to work with contracts. You will have to work on the BPO or the appraisal. Negotiate with all the lien holders negotiate and obtain the agreement, which is the approval letter, and then you go to closing. So, um, Pretty much when you find that you're gonna have a listing, you understand that it is a short sale, I would recommend going onto the bank's website. Let's say the seller's lender is Bank of America. I would go to Bank of America, you know, look up short sale, and they're gonna have specific short sale documents for that bank specifically. So get all your paperwork up front and then go to the seller and, and have them sign everything right then and there. You don't wanna have to be making trips back and forth. And lenders now, they don't accept electronic signatures. So even if you forget something and you say, here, you know, sign this, it has to be wet signed. So everything up front, do everything up front, that's what I always say, just get it out of the way. So you have a person who is a short sale candidate. You go out and you meet them, you get all the paperwork. Um, now you're going to be submitting the short sale paperwork to the lender. You have to pick a price, because you're gonna have to list it and you're gonna have to provide the MLS to the bank, whichever bank it is. Um, a lot of the times you're gonna have to put you know, in the MLS that it is a short sale, you're gonna have to advertise that. The banks will wanna see that too on your MLS printout. Um, how I pick the price when I begin, when I first get a listing, is I look at the as-is condition. I see, talk to the seller, what's wrong with it, you know, what's good with it, and then of course I pull my comps, and then I pick a price to what I feel the bank would accept as an offer amount. That price is gonna change, we'll talk about that later, hopefully not by too much, but um, it can change. Then you wanna pick um, a price that's reasonable, and let's say you have it listed and you haven't got any offers or anything going on, no phone calls, nothing, within the first seven days, keep dropping your list price until you get an offer. It'll actually help you in the future too if you wanna ever dispute the value that they came up with. Um, but you wanna be realistic. Um, I think I mentioned before, you wanna take advantage of problem situations. If you know the roof is bad or the foundation is bad, um, you definitely wanna advertise that in the MLS, and I'll kinda tell you why too. We good so far? I feel like I'm just blah, okay. <laughs> All right. So you've listed, you've, you picked a price, you've listed the property, now you wanna start your title search. It's really helpful to find a really good title company. This will go a long, long way. Um, I always say in a short sale, um, as a listing agent, you're the babysitter. <laughs> um, you have to make sure that the banks are doing their job, the title company is doing their job, that your seller, your buyer, the buyer's agent, I mean, you are basically running the show as the listing agent. Um, so one of the things you definitely wanna do is get the title search up front. You wanna see what liens, what judgments, what encumbrances are on that title because you as the listing agent have to know that, what they are, and then you have to negotiate all, everything. So HOA, second liens, tax liens, child support liens, all that. You guys are responsible for getting the title clear for that property. You wanna send in your letters of authorizations to any lenders, obviously the mortgage lenders, HOAs, foreclosure attorneys, you wanna be able to talk to everybody. So get the letters of authorization. It's, it simply can just say, you know, I, you know, Bob Seller give permission to Melody Medley to speak on behalf of my property and just their loan number and their address and that'll get you in. Um, so you also wanna initiate the short sales. Anybody worked on Equator before? Yeah, I got one. So Equator is an online portal between the banks and the agents. Um, it's Chase, Nation Star, and Bank of America that do Equator. So it's really helpful too. It's actually pretty neat because it records all the emails and conversations that you have. Um, everything is documented, so I really like that. As opposed to Wells Fargo's, everything is faxed in and they can always say, oh, I never got it. So. Um, so you definitely want to initiate the short sale. I think right now our short sale package for Wells Fargo is about 80 pages. Well, some of those are our own disclosures, but it is extensive. There is a lot of paperwork involved. So um, it's going to take the lender some time to actually review everything once you send it in. 
Um, and then you want to execute and submit the first offer right away, no matter what it is. Because remember, every day that their loan is not in short sale, that's a day closer to foreclosure your seller is. So it's very important to get the first offer in. It gets the ball rolling. It gets the appraisal ordered. We'll go into that. Um, and it just keeps it active into a short sale. If you wait for the highest and best offer, that could be weeks upon weeks and your, your seller could be facing foreclosure. So just want to get it in right away. Yes, ma'am. Um, his house is slated to be sold uh, May 3rd. May 3rd? Well, you have time. I do have yeah, time. Yeah, you do have time, yep. Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But don't delay. Don't delay, yeah. Most, most banks, and I say that, most banks require at least 30 days to start the short sale. Some banks, 7 to 10. It just really depends on who the lender is. At what point will that foreclosure be stopped? Um, that's a great question. It really depends on when you get your short sale package in. A lot of times you have to be assigned a processor or a negotiator. That's the one who's working on the file at the bank. And then they can determine, okay, I, you're going to want to have an offer too. Some, a reason for them to want to stop the foreclosure, not just that you sent in your short sale paperwork, but a good offer. So something that they could say, okay, yep, this is reason, reason enough to allow us time to review. So pretty much you'd just be on the phone all day, all day long, calling them every day, twice a day if you have to, especially when there's a foreclosure. So, yes, ma'am. Correct. Yes, you got it. No, it, it's a process. It kind of goes in a, a timeline of events. You get the offer, you submit it, um, and then the bank will order their appraisal, and we're about to get to that. Once they have their appraisal back in, they're going to come back and say, this is our approved price. So they'll either counter the offer they have, or they're accepted. Best case scenario, they accept it, and you can go to closing. If they counter it, then that's when you're going back and forth with negotiations. Okay, so, so. Yep, exactly, yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that is your responsibility. Yep. That's why it's always good to do your title up front. Yeah, oh yeah. You got it. Um, okay. So you've sent in your short sale package, you've listed it, you've got an offer. So now the bank's going to say, okay, let me send out our own appraiser. They're going to hire a third party, uh, BPO, broker price opinion. They'll do that for conventional loans. If your seller has a conventional loan, it'll be a BPO. If they have an FHA loan, then it's going to be an appraisal. So a little bit of difference. And it kind of tells you the difference between BPOs typically don't factor in repairs, but an appraisal will. The BPO and the appraiser are both as is condition. And then always need to make sure that it's an interior val evaluation. If they, if there, there are some called drive-bys, so you want to make sure that you're getting an interior evaluation. Because, yeah, if you drive by, the house could be completely different on the inside. So this is the turning point of the short sale. This is kind of, I say, the halfway point. Um, sometimes just to get to this point, it could take 45 to 60 days after submitting the offer in the short sale package. It takes the bank that long to review everything. Um, Say again? It would be FHA. They'll do an appraisal. Um, so what I found that's very helpful is if you, the agent, or you have the buyer meet the appraiser at the property or the BPO agent at the property, you want to make sure that you're getting a fair value. You don't want an appraiser to come in with his 15 minutes and say, four walls, a roof, let's do it, uh, you know, 300000 But you've got repair bids and estimates for over 100000 That's not a fair value. If you don't get a good value back, it could ruin your short sale. If they overappraised it, now you're stuck and you can't sell this overpriced property. So... Um, so if the buyer is an actual appraiser, that's even better. Oh, that would be even better, yeah. yeah. Now, you're going to get to those things where, you know, the appraiser is going to say, I, you know, I, I can't be uh, persuaded or, you know, biased. But a lot of the times what we found out is if you have your repair bids and your contract just kind of on the counter when they get there, they can look at it. So you're not shoving it in their face, but you're saying, oh, hey, by the way, I know you're not going to crawl in the attic and, you know, see that the electrical wiring has been chewed by rats. So... You know, it is very helpful. It is extremely helpful. Um, I took an appraisal class a couple weeks ago, and they said, you know, um, how to, uh, to not let the appraiser in when you get there or let them know how they will let you know if they're at the property. I probably just messed up my own joke, but um, <laughs> you, you don't put a lockbox on the door. That way they can't get in without you. 
So it, I say make it important. Make, make that, you know, a, a priority for you. Don't put a lot of bucks on it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess after you have some offers, you can you know change the status to contingent and then take the lockbox off. But on, and on CSS too, you can un uncheck the boxes that say you know CSS will allow inspections and appraisal. Uncheck those boxes, and the appraisal will have to call you to get in. So that's what I do. Yeah. yeah. So if I have a buyer, mm -hmm. can I not list it? Or they gonna really you're going to have to list it. Yeah. And the big banks, especially some of the smaller banks, they may not, but for the most part, you're going to have to list it because the bank's going to want to see that you're actively marketing it. So, good question though. Okay, so the BPO went out, you met them out there, you kind of showed them what was going on with the roof, the foundation, any repair bids that you had. Um, the bank's gonna come back with the appraisal report or BPO report, and they're also gonna compare that to what they're willing to take a loss on the mortgage. Um, so two th those two factors will actually play into what the approved price is, and that's what that's what you're going for with the short sale is you want to get to that approved price because that's what you know the bank will accept as the offer amount. Um, so at that point, it's about 60 to 70 days of the short sale process that they come back and they'll either accept the offer or they'll counter it. Typically, the lender is going to want 88% of that approved price. That's what they're looking to net. So after all your HOA fees, your tax liens, your commission, your closing costs, it still has to be roughly 88% of that appraised value. Um, you got to keep in mind too, these values, they will expire. So as a buyer's agent, helping a buyer buy a short sale, you need to ask the listing agent, when does that value expire? I've seen it too many times where, you know, a listing agent says, yes, 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 you know, 100,000 is the approved price. You submit the offer and then five days later they say, oh, they have to order a new appraisal and now the new value came back at 120. So it's really important to know when your values expire because they will and then you can get nipped in the butt if the values come back higher and especially in this market that's what I've been seeing lately is values come back higher. So if you have a good offer make sure you know when that value expires. You can always ask for an extension on that value too. So everybody good? Okay. So let's say that you have that you have one of those those really high priced um, approved prices. Um, you, you go out to the property, you know it's not worth more than 80000 but the bank came back and said, no, we want 150 for it. And you're thinking, there's no way. And you, as the listing agent, have to protect your client <laughs> to be able to sell the property, but now you can't because they overpriced it. So what do you do? Um, and for investors, this is kind of, um, I don't know, a loophole maybe? <laughs> But you can dispute the value. If you think it's overpriced and you know that one because you've listed it and you haven't got any offers near to what the bank wants, you know what the condition of the property is, so you know it's not worth 150, you can do what's called a value dispute. And this is where your repair bids will come in handy again. Um, again, the banks don't have to agree to lowering the price, but typically I find that the values will decrease if you submit a value dispute, at least after 60 days after you've marketed and listed and no buyers are coming in. So a value dispute, um, it really depends on the note holder of the mortgage. Um, they make the final decision on everything. Because you got to think, even with their approved price, they're already taking a loss on that mortgage. So now you're asking them to take even more of a loss. So it's a process, but it can be done, and it can be done successfully. Um, value disputes, they don't work on move-in ready houses. So if you have a beautiful house, move-in ready, turnkey ready, you're not going to have any repair bids to give. So most, and the most banks are going to realize, like, nope, I need at least, you know, the approved price amount to be able to, to close. So required for a value dispute, if you want to submit it in, you need to get comps to justify why you're submitting a lower offer and why you feel that their price is overpriced. Excuse me. Repair bids. And then pictures of damages. The pictures and the repair bids go a long way. I think that's what really seals your deal. I always do a letter of explanation too, saying I've had it listed since this date, you know, at this price, you guys made me, you know, jack it up, so now I've listed it at this price with nothing. CSS, you know, agent feedback remarks, I submit those too. Any type of evidence that you can submit to the bank to show them that they're crazy and that their value is too high will go a long way. Um, pictures, colored pictures are great. A lot of the times you'll have a point of contact at the bank, you'll have their email address, so if you can send them colored photos, it really helps. Um, I even submitted a video one time, so that, that actually worked out in my favor. So anything that you can do to prove your point, will, the bank will reconsider and look at it. Any questions about that? Mm, okay. Um, 
Repair bids, and you want to do significant repair bids. You don't carpet, paint, they don't, that's lipstick, they don't care about that. They're not looking at that. Major issues, foundation, roof, electrical, plumbing, things of that nature will really, really make a dent in their value. Um, oh, and if you are the buyer buying a short sale, you can't use your own construction company that's in your name to present your own repair bids. You want to get a third party or somebody else. That makes sense. So you basically, let's see, where are we? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Talked about value disputes. Okay. So during this time, we were already at what, 70 days when we got the approved price back. So you're at 70 days and you're holding on to that buyer, whether you're the listing agent or the buyer's agent. To help your buyers understand, they, they really just need to be patient. Knowledge is power. I'm always very open and communicative with my any one of my buyers or my buyer's agents. Always let them know what kind of stage of the process it is, you know, looking forward what the next step is. You want to advise the buyers to meet the, the BPO or the appraisal at the property. You want the buyer to be able to close on time. Um, then the buyers, they need to be made aware that they pretty much pay for all closing costs, like their closing costs. The seller's lender will pay for the commission and the title policy, but everything else is going to be on the buyer. Survey, um, home warranties if they want that. There will be no seller concessions, things of that nature. So just prep the buyer. You know, they may have to pay just a little bit more. Um, but if you have a good title company that you work with, I'm sure they won't overcharge you guys. Um, they will have to turn on the utilities for their own inspections if the property is vacant. They, they will be responsible for that. Um, any appraisals that they need for their loan, things of that nature. Um, resale certificates will be charged and then if, if, re if they require a survey, that will be something. All right. So you got the property listed. You got the approved price back. You know what the bank wants. They've already told you. Maybe you've done a value dispute to get the value down lower. So now what you have is a full price offer and you're ready to submit it. You as the agent need to make the HUD, the final HUD, the settlement statement. You can have your title company do it, but I recommend that you do it. So you know what's going on with your loan and your property. Um, by this time, you would have already seen the title commitment. You would have had months to look at this title commitment, negotiate with HOAs, negotiate with anybody that you need to. Um, and you're going to make the HUD because you're going to put everything on there. Um, HOAs, they can be difficult, um, especially because the short lenders will pay a certain amount of HOA, past HOA fees. I typically try to get the short lender to pay for everything. Second liens, HOAs, um, child support liens, things of that nature. I try to get the bank to pay for everything. If the bank comes back and says, no, I'm not paying the HOA, then I'm on the phone with the HOA saying, hey, we're in a short sale. The seller doesn't have any money. She's missed mortgage payments. That's why she's missed HOA payments. Can we make an agreement? Um, and if you're a good negotiator, a lot of the times the HOAs will say, we'll take some money instead of no money. So. Um, second liens, they need to get paid off too, so if you have a second lien on a property, you'll have to start a short sale with that second lien as well. But you'll already have all the paperwork, so just a little bit of extra work. Um, any city liens, you need to put on the HUD. Basically, you're the one who's negotiating everything. So you're looking at that title and making sure that once everybody's paid, this title's clear. Now, your title company can help you and direct you. If you have judgments or things that you don't know about, go to your title company and say, hey, what do I do to get this clear? And they'll tell you whether it's pay them or you know, maybe they can make a homestead affidavit just to get it lifted. So, uh, but again, you have to make the HUD. You're submitting this. If you get the HUD wrong when you submit it, it could ruin your whole short sale. So you go to, let's say you get this approved and then you go to closing. Now the title company is saying, well, what about all these other liens? You have to go back and start all over again. So again, know your title. Put everything on your HUDs. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you learn pretty quick about that. Um, so you have to negotiate everything. OK, you submitted your full price offer. You submitted your HUD. This is the whole you know, five to six months that you just worked for is for this shining moment, is to get your short sale approval letter. This allows you to go to closing. There are quite a few things you need to know about this short sale approval letter. Um, there's going to be an expiration date on it. You have to close by a certain date. So make sure that you are telling the buyer, the buyer's agent, the buyer's loan officer, the title company, you want everybody to be involved to know when you have to close this by. Now, most banks will give you an extension on that approval letter. 
but you have to have a really good reason why. If it's cash and you need an extension, they're not going to give it to you. Now, if it's a loan and there's an issue with the loan, you can explain that to the lender. They'll generally give you an extension. But everybody needs to be made aware of that closing date. Um, and obviously, in the approval letter, that's where it's going to say no recourse to the seller. And as a listing agent, that's why you're working on this on behalf of your sellers, because you don't want the bank coming back um, on the deficiency. Now, luckily, I think we closed 101 last year. Not one had any recourse on it. But that's for first liens. Second liens will typically put recourse on there. And there are ways to help the homeowner through that if that happens. Um, approval letters, investors, agents. Um, in the last six months, every approval letter I've gotten has had a deed restriction on it. Um, every now and then, there won't be one. Some conventional loans, um, they won't put a deed restriction on it. Deed restriction is typically 30 days you cannot sell the property at all. You can't transfer the warranty deed over at all. Um, and then it's up to 190 uh, days, excuse me, 90 days that you can't sell it for more than 120% of what you bought it for. So be careful with that. And any, anybody that I go under contract with that I know it's, the offer's going to get approved, I let them know, hey, potential deed restriction, are you guys okay with this? So full disclosure, um, but you guys just keep, keep uh, an open mind about that. You want to avoid promissory notes. A promissory note is basically an IOU saying, okay, I, I know um, I still owe 15000 Don't ever let the seller sign a promissory note. Basically, that's why you're doing the short sale in the first place, is to avoid the deficiency. So avoid a promissory note. You want to be proactive about the buyer's loan. Um, with the new regulations and things, it's, you know, it's caused you know, just a little bit of a ruffle, but uh, make sure that you're in contact with the buyer's loan officer. I always include the loan officer and the buyer's agent in an email and I send it together. Hey, just following up, what's going on? Because again, you have a deadline that you have to meet. Even if the contract says that you're going to close three months from now, some loan officers look at that and say, oh, we got time, we're good. And you're thinking, oh, no, 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 we have three weeks. <laughs> so make sure everybody is aware, make sure that you're active. Again, you're the babysitter, you're making sure everybody is on the same page and getting it to closing. Now, you do want to get the final HUD from the title company. They're the ones who are going to put on the buyer's fees, things of that nature. Um, so that will have to come from the title company. Um, and then you want to coordinate the closing. You want to make sure that all parties are there and ready to go to closing um, with, that di with that deadline. Everybody's clear on that? Okay. Title company, here's what they're good for. Um, they can clear judgments. Um, they can make affidavits of airships, things that you will need. Not same person affidavit. The warranty deeds, the title company, this is why having a good title company comes in handy. Excuse me. One, the title company knows that your seller doesn't have any money. They're in a short sale. They can't afford these things. So it's really good to talk to a good attorney who understands that process. And they understand that they're not going to get paid until the deal closes. Um, but this is what my title company helps me with a lot. <laughs> day in and day out, this is what they help me with. Um, again, I just made a little note. You guys do everything as agents. Um, you have to know the fees a lender will pay. If you're putting something on the HUD, like a, um, a repair fee or something, you're just going to waste more time because the lender is going to reject it and now you have to go back and resubmit everything. So just know the fees the lenders will pay. If you go to their websites, they'll actually have what will be paid and what won't. So that's helpful when you're making your HUDs. Know all the costs um, and then again, just, just know what's going on throughout, throughout your whole short sale. And then the biggest thing that kind of comes up, and this is again back to when you get your title, um, you want to look at the title commitment and you want to see you know, anything of the sort and then figure out how to, how to resolve it. So with the death, and typically when you talk to your, your sellers up front, you're going you're gonna to want to ask these questions so you know what paperwork that you're going to need to get done. Um, taxes, things like that. Um, Bad BPOs, we already talked about that, how to do that. Renters, <laughs> um, they, they can kill a deal, but typically if you know how to talk to them properly, they, they will understand and move out without wrecking the property because they get to live there for rent free for the next few months while you do the short sale. So typically they're, they're okay with it. Um, bankruptcies, I think you mentioned that. but um, So these could be potential roadblocks, but you just want to make sure you know what you're dealing with up front before you get into the whole you know, six months of the short sale. If there's a bankruptcy situation, do I need to work with your attorney? Um, yes and no. If, if the property is under bankruptcy protection, you're going to have to get it out of bankruptcy. So you're going to have to get the bankruptcy attorney to file a motion to sell. And that in itself will take 30 days for the judge to grant it. 
which costs a little bit of money, but sometimes I've talked to bankruptcy attorneys that said, well, if they're already paying you for all this other stuff, can you just kind of, you know, give this one for free? And sometimes they'll work with you on that. Um, but yeah, you're going to need to know. And if the house is not under bankruptcy protection, you're good. All you'll need is just a letter of authorization from that bankruptcy attorney saying, yes, you can do the short sale. But you see the number of short sales you know, yes and no. Um, I think the last Roddy report, and don't, don't quote me on this, um, um, I think there was over 600 uh, names still on the foreclosure list. And that was just for the month of May. So there are still a lot of short sales out there. Um, the short sales that I've been getting in lately, they're really nice properties. I don't have a lot of distressed properties anymore. Before, like last year, all last year, I mean, it was just distress after distress. I mean, so easy to get rid of. I mean, it was great. But now it's all really nice properties in all different types of areas. So, And then the appraisals are coming back a little bit higher because the market's been so good. So, it, you know, you can kind of get stuck now and then. But if you know how to negotiate and get the value down, then you can sell it. So. That's a good question. Um, well, you guys made that easy for me. Um, questions? Am I I'm that awesome? Uh, do you have uh, like listings on your website that other people don't have? Um, everything's on MLS, but um, I can give you a neat offers list. I do send it out about every other week for investors who don't have access to MLS. Yeah, if you come to our booth, we'll, we'll get you signed up. So. Um, If a lender says no to a short sale? Um, yes and no. Um, if it's too late, like if the foreclosure is too soon, like it, it, foreclosure is tomorrow. So if you came to me and said, hey, Mel, can you help me stop this foreclosure? I'm going to say no. Um, if, a, if a client makes more money, uh, if they have really good income, and you can't prove that their expenses um, out, um, sorry, <laughs> if their expenses are outweigh their income, then they're not going to prove it. Basically, if they're making money, if they're not in a hardship, then they're going to say, well, then go make your mortgage payments. Um, people who have really good credit, it's, it's kind of you know um, a two-way street. If they have really good credit and they have money, they're going to say, okay, we'll go get another loan to pay us off. So I've seen it there that they've had really good credit and they have money. That's typically the only times I've ever seen a bank saying, no, we're not going to do a short sale for you. If the buyer is going to uh, flip the property, mm -hmm. um, that needs to be disclosed to the bank. Ye to the, I'm sorry, to the lender. Yeah, pretty much you won't be able to do that. Like, not an immediate flip. You're going to have to hold it for at least 30 days. And the unfortunate. Sorry, oh, how many days? 30. 30 days. You got to hold it for 30 days. Yes. So you're not going to hold sale. Mm -mm. But, you won't be able to. But it does. We just did one, and, and we had to. We had to. It was Chase, and uh, all they required was a disclosure that this property is going to be is an investment property. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't any set time period on it as far as 30 days or 90, 120 days. But I've heard Chase. sometimes there is. Mm -hmm. It was a seller's um, loan a conventional loan? Was a seller's loan a conventional loan? Do you remember? Yeah. Then, yeah, we're seeing that conventional loans, they're not putting a deed restriction on, which is great. Um, but it will be in the approval letter. And unfortunately, we never know until we get that approval letter to where it says there is a deed restriction on it. So, yeah, you, we've had it to where we've gotten an approval letter. You know, I even advise the buyer, like, hey, there may be a deed restriction, but we won't know until we get the approval letter. Get the approval letter, there's a deed restriction. Buyer says, I can't do it. You know, I was trying to wholesale so this. The lender can't come back and Say, hey, you didn't tell us you were going to sell the property. Yeah, if it's not in the approval letter, you can do whatever you want. No, not at all. Yeah. No, not at all. You mentioned deed restriction about 120% of purchase price. Did it factor in repairs too? Because we put 20,000, 20% of repairs in. Is that factored in? Mm -hmm. You can't sell it for more than 120% of what you bought it for. Mm hmm. Yep. Not within the 30 days. Uh, that's 90 days that you can't sell it for more than 120%. 30 days just right off the bat, and then 100, uh, 90 days if you're going to sell it more than 120%. But it's all in the approval letter, you know, and that's, you know, it's kind of unfortunate. You wait six months to get that approval letter, and then you're like, oh, there's the deed restriction. And I wish they could tell us up front, but, but they don't. Once you get the approval letter, are you stuck at that point, or can you back out? Well, it depends on how your contract is written. 
Um, if I have an approved price um, and I know that this offer is going to get approved, I make the buyers do their inspections right then and there when they get the executed contract. Because even when you submit your full price offer, it's going to take 30 days to get that approval. So I, you know, and even for the buyer's sake, you don't want to waste 30 days if you know your buyer's going to back out at the last minute. Because if the buyer walks, now you don't have an offer to tell the short lender, so the short lender could start foreclosing process because now you don't have an active offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can. It goes to the seller. Mm -hmm. Yes. Say, oh, say it one more time. I I say no less than five hundred or one percent of the sales price. That's negotiable. So. Um, but if it's a full price offer, then after your option period, I'm going to say, okay, go deposit your earnest money. I'm not going to ask for earnest money up front until you're completely satisfied with your purchase. Because I know we're going to get the approval letter. So. If you're using, oh. if, if you're using hard money, mm -hmm. then you want to make sure in your offer that you, you check pending lender approval. Yes. Yeah. If your if your lender is going to ask for an appraisal and a survey, things of that nature. You put cash, like it's a cash deal, mm -hmm. and that hard money drops out, then yeah. Go. yeah, yeah, yep. Are there any circumstances where you can't perform a short sale like this? Probably going through a loan point. It's been approved for a loan modification. If the seller does not want to keep the property and they got approved for the loan mod, you just have to tell the lender they want to sell the property and then they will automatically be taken out of the loan modification and then enrolled into a short sale. But as an agent or the one dealing with the bank, you're going to have to tell them. Um, it could catch you up a little because loan mods, you have a three month trial period if they did get approved. You may have to wait out that three months before you can initiate the short sale. So, yes sir. Uh, say it again. I've never seen that. You probably want to talk to your title company and see what they would require. Um, uh, like mechanics liens, I'm not saying they're the same, but a mechanics lien, we had one where a, um, uh, a guy had a water filtration system company and he went and put in a new system and the seller didn't pay, so he put a judgment against the property. But I called the guy directly, talked to him, let him know what was going on. We worked out a deal and he got paid and he released his lien. So maybe something to that effect? That'd be a great question for a title company. Anybody else? We do have a booth in the back, so if you guys think of anything, if you have any questions, let us know. Um, we're always here. I think you have one. Yeah, the lender won't, it, they, they're not the ones who place the judgment or the lien against them. They're just going after their mortgage. Yeah, but they will pay, they will pay subordinate liens. Mm -hmm. You have to negotiate that and put it on your HUD, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you for letting me speak and blabber up here. So, hope you learned something. But again, we're back in the back. If you haven't signed in, go to our booth, sign in as an agent so you can get your credit. Um, and if you want the copy of the presentation, drop off a business card too and, and we'll, we'll email it to you.